Our speaker today is a lifelong Memphian, a graduate of Memphis University School, as well as what was then known as Memphis State University. And he has been involved with some of our community's greatest assets over the course of his long and illustrious career. You'll see that he has a key around his neck. That's not to get into his house. <laughs> I don't think. It's a key to the city. Um, he has been a, the, the duck master. Um, he's worked with the park commission. It's hard to say what Jimmy hasn't done that's legal. Um, <laughs> but he really is our Homer and our Virgil. He tells the tales of the tribe. And it's going to be a great loss. But he is coming back to Memphis. He's promised, right? Yes. So, Jimmy, you're on. Wow. <laughs> the name of this program is Historic Memphis, the Modern Memphis. And I'm a lifelong Memphian, Shelby County historian. There's some of the various images of me right there. Uh, and again, I want to thank the sponsors again. <laughs> Don't mind doing that at all, because it really helps keep these nonprofits going, not just the Pink Palace, but the zoo and Memphis and May, all these places. So thank you all for doing that. Now, currently right now, our, for today, our, our kind of our, our object of the day, and I lost that piece of paper, it's Burton Calicott. Uh, Come see historic Memphis to modern Memphis history through Calicott murals located in the Pink Palace Mansions lobby. Now, back in the oh, the Depression era, Works Progress Administration, what eventually became, became uh, Burton Calicut, like a lot of artists, got to get uh, jobs. And he, you come out here and see the murals in the in the lobby over here. And of course, he got he was like too fancy and all that stuff. And some old conservative folks came and actually yelled at him about it. But these are terrific murals you see over here, uh, the Calicut murals. You probably noticed them some other places around town, like that old leader Federal Bank on Poplar that they actually took them out of or covered them up, you know. So come out and look at the uh, Calicott murals, please. There he is when it was being taken, and then here's a, another big shot down in the newly renovated portion of the Pink Palace Museum. I'd like to thank Memphis Heritage, West Tennessee Historical Society, uh, the Register's Office, and the Memphis Room. These are the folks you get all this information from all the time, folks. Now, this is historic Memphis, the modern Memphis, okay? And what I like to say is there's, a, there's no city in America that tells a story of American history better than Memphis, Tennessee, good, bad, or ugly, okay? From the early Native Americans and European explorers to the 20th century entrepreneurs, from civil war to civil rights, music, medicine, transportation, distribution, all the first, all the highlights. I say, I say there's about 468 good years of history here in Memphis. I've been told I got 150 hours of B-roll in my head, and I got about 40 minutes to talk about it right now. So I'm going to talk real fast. And that's why I call this the Cliff Notes version. Okay? Has anybody heard of Cliff Notes? If you haven't, you're a liar. So I'm going to say, you're out. Okay? For sure. But this, is, and I don't, this is not a book on sale, by the way. Somebody asked me that the other day. I didn't, it's not a book. But, but when you think about way back, in, well, let's get to it here. Oh, here's Welcome to Memphis here. This is a sign that used to be there at the old bridge. Uh, coming across when it's Highway 7. We've got homes, we got industries, we got parks, we got schools. Hey, we got air. Can you believe we were telling people we got air in Memphis, Tennessee? <laughs> and we know about our water, you know. But anyway, most of the senior citizens I show this film to, or this picture, they remember that because that's where they got their first speeding ticket. That's where the motorcycle cop was behind. <laughs> the Shelby County Welcoming Committee. Back they got on I-40 now, you know what I mean? No, but Memphis is number six on the National Register of Historic Places for listings in our country behind Washington, Baltimore, Philadelphia, Boston, and New Orleans. Think about that. We have over 11,000 properties listed. Memphis is a point of discovery, one of the three oldest in the United States, site of the first river engagement between Europeans and Native Americans in the history of our country. And this is when Hernando de Soto, the Spanish explorer, came wandering through the south looking for the Pacific Ocean, which is over there somewhere. Uh, you can see kind of like a, a family circus track right here. You've seen that cartoon where a kid comes straight home from school, you know. No, he didn't. Uh, and he wandered all around and got to the highest piece of ground on the Mississippi River between Cairo and Natchez. That's where downtown Memphis is. Used to flood 35 miles in that direction. So when he got here in the spring of the year, all he could see was water. He thought he discovered the Pacific Ocean. They thought the Ohio River flowed into the Gulf of California, not the Gulf of Mexico. The earth was flat at the time, right, Greer? Flat. Uh, and that was 79 years before the pilgrims landed at Plymouth Rock. Now, when we were all growing up, Plymouth Rock was like Genesis 1-1 in the founding of America, wasn't it? 79 years before that, Europeans are out here in this Memphis area. 
So if we start with the Mississippi River. You can't start anything about Memphis without talking about the Mississippi River. It drains 41 percent of continental North America. That's 31 states and two provinces of Canada. Basically everything between the Rocky Mountains and the Smoky Mountains flows by here. The uh, Missouri River starts here above Montana and Alberta and Saskatchewan and comes all the way down to St. Louis. The upper Mississippi starts here at Lake Itasca in upper Minnesota comes down to uh, the tip of Illinois. The Ohio starts over here in New York, western Pennsylvania, western West Virginia, comes to Pittsburgh, the tr three rivers there, comes on down to the tip of Illinois. And no river flows directly from the Appalachian Mountains to the lower Mississippi, the Tennessee and Cumberland turn and go to Paducah. And all that comes down by Memphis here, about an average of 330,000 gallons a minute at about eight miles an hour. And every gallon of water has a teaspoon of mud in it. Okay, <laughs> that's why it's the muddy Mississippi. Uh, flowing on that's why this is the flattest place on earth right through here it drops one foot in elevation per mile as you go from Cairo down to New Orleans okay so the odd Mississippi River the oddest most meandering large river in the world just look at some of these facts here I like to talk about the levees and the astronauts back in 1927 we had a big flood Congress created the Flood Control Act in 1928 started there's the largest project in the history of the Corps of Engineers and it's so big that when the astronauts are descending on Earth, anybody been in space here yet? Nobody? Okay. Well, next time you go into space and you're descending on Earth, think about this. The first man-made structure the astronauts recognize on Earth is uh, the Great Wall of China, not the Astrodome or the Superdome or the St. Louis Arch. And the second most visible structure when you're descending on Earth is the earth and levee system of the Mississippi River. 300 feet wide, 40 feet tall, about 200, 300 miles long. It's huge. And that's what, uh, you can't control the Mississippi River, but only a commodator. It's too thick to drink, too thin to plow. If a raindrop falls in Lake Itasca, it takes 90 days to get to the headwaters to the Gulf of Mexico. 90 days. That's a slow river. Uh, some names for the mighty Mississippi River. Uh, the Gathering of Waters, Big Muddy, Old Man River, Mighty Mississippi. Mark Twain called it the Great Sewer, as Mark Twain could do. <laughs> You know, you throw a cigarette down in Wrigley Field, it'll eventually come by Memphis when you think about that in the storm drain systems. Uh, now, all roads lead to the high bluff, and they are planned by the animals. Think about this a long time ago when that water was flooding, the Wolf River. Remember in 2011 when the Wolf River flowed up and covered the CBHS high school football field? Yeah. Or uh, Rodney Baber and the non Connor swole up, and of course Riverside Drive got partially covered. Uh, well, that was happening a long time ago, so the animals wanted to keep their little paws dry. So when the water rose up in the spring, they'd come up to the high ground. They'd walk out to the east on a high ridge, walk out to the southeast on a high ridge. The, Na the Native Americans later on would follow the animal pass. The European explorers would follow the Native American pass. The American settlers would follow the European explorers pass. Then we had wagon trains, and then we paved poplar. So poplar is just an old animal trail. <laughs> and so is Lamar. That's my, this is my map, by the way. <laughs> Isn't it great? Uh, right down to the highest piece of ground right there between Cairo and Natchez. Our fourth, we're on the fourth Chickasaw Bluff, the first being 60 miles north up in Fort Pillow, Fulton, Tennessee. 40 miles north is Randolph. 20 miles north is Meeman Shelby Forest State Park. And then you got uh, Memphis down here. This is actually a picture of Randolph. That's what it looks like now. That's what Memphis was look, would look like if the buildings weren't here. That's what it looked like a long time ago. The seven flags that fly on the south point uh, of the Mud Island that, excuse me, used to fly there. Uh, for some reason, they don't anymore. Uh, we'll get that into another show, I guess. But there's the seven flags of jurisdiction in the last 468 years, beginning with Fran Spain, then France, Great Britain, Britain, the United States, North Carolina. North Carolina came all the way across. We're the first territory to become a state uh, in 1790, uh, 1782. We're the, first, uh, the third state to join the Union after the original 13 colonies, Tennessee, and then the Confederate States for one year. So those are our seven flags that have flown here jurisdictionally over the last uh, 468 years. We had an early fort, a Spanish fort. We actually had one 1739 Fort Assumption. It only lasted two months because the French didn't like the mosquitoes or the uh, humidity up here, I don't think. Uh, then, we, then, the, then the Spanish came in, had a fort. Then 1795, 1795, a treaty was signed that Spain released all its rights east of the Mississippi and north of Louisiana. So they moved across the river to where Fort Esperanza was, or uh, in Crittenden County now. And then we became uh, the United States, and there's Tennessee, Vermont, Kentucky, Tennessee. And then you see we grew uh, from 1803 all the way down in a balanced fashion, one from the north, one from the west, north, west. See, the south was considered the west at the time. We didn't go much past the Mississippi River. Missouri was the first state in 1821, uh, and that's when we had 11 free states, 11 slave states. So Maine broke off from Massachusetts, you see. So we set 12 and 12, then Arkansas was the next 
So then 1803, the Louisiana Purchase, I got the French out of here in 1803. And then uh, the War of 1812, I think is the most important war uh, for Memphis. Everybody talks about some other wars around here, but I like the War of 1812 the best because that was our, our second war of independence from Great Britain, we say. There's three ma- it's a very benign war for three years, three major theaters, Lake Erie, uh, Chesapeake Bay, and New Orleans. Uh, down there, of course, our, one of our co-founders and the former uh, future president of the United States, Andrew Jackson, uh, helped that last decisive battle of New Orleans in 1850. Remember that song by Johnny Horton? 1850, or 1814, we took a little trip. You got it, Linda. Come on, sing along with me. Along the mud. Oh, okay. Okay. Great song, Johnny Horton. But um, Star Spangled Banner was written during that time. Uh, all sorts of things went on, but that was our last war of independence. Big earthquake in 1811, 1812. Series of earthquakes. They say church bells rang as far away as Charleston, South Carolina. They said the river flowed backwards. Uh, Real Foot Lake formed during that time right here. Uh, and that was 1811, 1812. We call this the sunken land in Arkansas. Have you been over in Ar- eastern Arkansas lately and seen the Johnny Cash Bullhood Home and the Sultana Museum and the Southern Tenants Farmer Association, the Hemingway Pfeiffer House, the Wilson Cafe, and Wildwood Antiques? It's a great day trip over there. So the first 22 years we're a state, all of West Tennessee is not even owned by the state of Tennessee. This is East Tennessee. This is West Tennessee. This is the Chickasaw Nation between the Tennessee River and the Mississippi River. Andrew Jackson and Isaac Shelby purchased that 6.8 million acres of land for $330,000, or about four and a half cents an acre, on 20 annual payments of $15,000 each to the, to the Chickasaw. Yeah, payment plan there. Pretty smart, aren't they? Uh, and that's what uh, quickly made this land developable over here. That's 21 counties now. So when we were actually formed first, we were also Tipton County and Fayette County, you see. Memf- uh, Shelby County was. So the, the county seat had to be located centrally. That's closer. So for the first 40 years, our county seat's in Raleigh. Uh, after the Civil War and the steamboat landing, the railroad comes in here. It moves back down to Memphis. So Tipton County formed in 1823, Fayette County, 1824. 1819, this is the original layout of Memphis, basically from the Pyramid to St. Jude, down Danny Thomas to Union Avenue to the river. 362 lots, 1,309 acres. That's the original street plan is still there. This is the Gayoso Bayou. Don't you love the Gayoso Bayou like me? Uh, but that was kind of it was a big swamp at the time. It restricted our growth any further. So it was really slow going for the first seven or eight years. We didn't sell too many lots. And next week, we'll t- our next session, we'll talk about that in Before Memphis. Our three co-founders, James Winchester, Andrew Jackson, and John Overton, uh, they were our three co-founders. James Winchester gave us the name Memphis from Nile, the Nile River in the uh, Delta. We call us the Bluff City. You've heard that, the Bluff City, right? Well, here's some of my bluffs about it. Our three, our three founders never lived here. Okay, our founders, John Overton and Franklin, Andrew Jackson in Nashville, and then uh, uh, James Winchester in Castilian Springs, which is crack font. There are three historic homes are up there. Uh, three, uh, Shelby was not a Tennessee, and our county's named for the governor of Kentucky. Huh? Because of that treaty. Peabody was an Englishman by the time we named the Peabody Hotel for him. I, I, Peabody, it's 150 years old this year. He's named for an Englishman. And our first mayor, Marcus Winchester, the son of James Winchester, he's buried underneath a parking garage right now there at St. Jude. They forgot to move his graves in the, in the 1870s. They're moving graves. They put a parking garage over him. So that's a bluff. And then our four original squares. We had four original squares, court, market, exchange, and auction. Named for their intended purpose. But the first schoolhouse was in Court Square. The first courthouse was in Market Square. The first market was over in Exchange Square. We never got that right. And Auction Square, that block, we didn't auction slaves in Auction Square. That was our farmer's market. That block was put there in 1924. So don't listen to what the trolley drivers tell you right now. We weren't auctioning slaves in 1924. It says so on the block, folks. And there's all sorts of newspaper stories. So we, we're kind of the bluff city there. Some of the early adventurers and settlers here, Davy Crockett, Andrew Jackson became the seventh president. Later on, Zachary Taylor became, the, I believe, the twelfth president. John James Alderman came here for one day and looked at birds. There's a whole lot of birds here. Meriwether Lewis was stationed here before the Lewis and Clark. Zebulon Pike, his son, is what Pike Peak's name for it. Lincoln came down in a canoe one time, you know. Uh, Davy Crockett won his seat to the House of Representatives twice, lost twice on that second time. He said, to hell with Tennessee, I'm going to Texas. Got killed the next year at the Alamo, so Texas didn't do him any good either, did they? Did they? Uh, in 1840s and 50s, we started getting boats down here. and You get off of, you know, I said every gallon of water has a teaspoon of mud. That's a lot of siltation. Our water fluctuates 40 feet here during the course of the year. That's a lot of siltation that builds up. So you get off a boat here, you step off into that mud, you go about knee deep, and 
pull your leg out of it, suck your shoe or boot off. <laughs> Wasn't a friendly way to come to Memphis. So we started laying cobblestones in the 1850s, 19 different work sessions, over a million cobblestones. That got us on the map with the steamboats. And then we decided to lay a railroad. Now, how many of y'all love this railroad track going by us right here? <laughs> Nobody likes the railroad track? You're a good man. You're a smart man, too. You know where I'm going with this. It was the first railroad to connect the Atlantic Ocean with the Mississippi River in the history of our country from Charleston. It was about 800 miles at a time, and most railroads are about 100 miles. Now, imagine this. Uh, it was like going to the moon in transportation terms, okay? You're riding a horse and buggy 10 miles an hour. Now you're riding a train about 60 miles an hour, not going through these mountains and everything. Boom, getting to Memphis. Most trains are about a, lines are about 100 miles long, 800 miles long. It was such a big deal. We had a big event here. I believe it was May 2nd. Yeah, one of our first Memphis and May events here was May 2nd, 1857. The wedding of the waters, the greatest day, the greatest demonstration of popular joy ever witnessed in the lower Mississippi River Valley. We're pouring a bucket of water into it a river with 330,000 gallons into it. Isn't that exciting in 1857? There you go. At that time, the 19th century, we had 400 sawmills in this area. We're the hardwood capital of the world from 1880 to 1920. 70% of the cotton crop in America is within 200 miles of Memphis. We're the cotton capital of the world between 1803 and 1937. Cotton was the number one export out of the USA. Uh, we're also the meal trading capital world, 40,000 annually. This Mr. Mills traded almost, uh, uh, gosh, about a million and five, looks like there. It was huge. Before we had tractors, you know, first all mechanized cotton crop didn't come until 1943 down in Clarksdale. And right now, 45% of the rice in America grows between Memphis and Little Rock. 45% of the rice, big rice country. Uh, well, Keystone of the Southern Arch, we get up to the, to the Civil War. The Union strategy was get control of the Western Rivers. That's number one strategy. Number two is once you get control of the rivers, uh, you take control of the newspapers. So you had the Anaconda Plan where General Scott comes around the coastlines, comes up the Mississippi River. The, the Union fleet comes down from Cairo. Uh, so what happens? They're going to meet uh, in Memphis. Now, the reason why you want to get control of Memphis is because the six newspapers here at the time, uh, that was pretty huge, but you could control the troop and supply movement between the railroad and the cobblestones here. Transportation is what saved our city from being destroyed in the Civil War. Atlanta, Charleston, Montgomery got burned. Memphis didn't have a single shot fired on it, not a single building burned because, uh, well, here's another, let's go to the, let's go to the uh, moving appeal. Our newspaper picked up and left. Your commercial appeal picked this press up. In fact, you saw old Betsy going to the uh, Pink Pilots just got here. That's not the same press, but, uh, and they went, uh, they wanted to print the Confederate news, but if you didn't print the Union news, your type got thrown in the river. So he went uh, three states, a thousand miles in three years, uh, always one step ahead of the, the Union uh, advancement. Uh, he was known as the Bible of the Confederacy, the hornet's nest of the rebellion, that damn rebel rag. Got caught in Macon, wagon back to Chattanooga on a boat back to Memphis and reopened back in November of 1865. We'll talk about that in the Civil War times. Union occupation. How ironic it was that Northerners were selling guns and butter to Southerners. Who killed Northerners? And Southerners were shipping food and cotton to Northerners. Who killed Southerners? It's like spy versus spy versus spy in the old mag magazine. You know, everybody knew everybody. First Tennessee bank opened here as First National Bank in the middle of the Civil War. Business was so good. We had, uh, and now it's uh, the 14th oldest bank charter in America, and we housed over 7,000 wounded Union soldiers during the time. Started by great hospital tradition. Uh, the largest inland naval battle in the world occurred on June 6, 1862. So 5,000 citizens had come out and sat on the banks of the city of Memphis, okay, and watched the naval battle of Memphis out in the water. They're just shooting at each other. There's no advancements onto the land, okay? So no shots fired up here. It only took 90 minutes because there's triple the boat power and gun power of the Union fleet. And, uh, and it ended up being the largest inland naval battle in the history of the world. Boom, right there, June 6, 1862, right in front of Memphis. Now the war's over with. The quickest way to get Union soldiers back uh, to uh, north from, uh, to be uh, mustered out was by boat, not by car, not by car, but not by wagon, not by railroad. Uh, so boat certificates were relaxed. Uh, five dollar, uh, captains were incentivized, five dollars for every enlisted man, ten dollars for every officer. The boat called the Sultana. How many of y'all heard of the Sultana? Very, oh, very good. Have you heard of the Titanic? Yeah. <laughs> Most of my tours, nobody's heard of the Sultana, but they've heard of the Titanic because Leonard DiCaprio was on the Titanic, right? <laughs> So this boat goes down to New Orleans, comes back to Natchez, comes back to Vicksburg, 
By the time it gets back to Memphis, this boat certificated for 376 passengers has over 2,300 people on it, six times its legal limit, 100 horses, one stove, uh, you know, uh, for a seven-day trip and faulty boilers. How would you like to get about another 300 people in here and about 10 horses right now? Stay here for about a week. <laughs> Y'all wouldn't be sitting next to each other, would you, Kurt? No. So uh, got to Memphis, left eight, uh, on the evening of April 26, went about seven miles up river. The boilers blew. Bodies flowed by Memphis for days. Uh, over 1,700 uh, people lost their life, the largest maritime disaster in the history of our country. First railroad, largest in the naval battle, largest maritime disaster, and we're just 1865, folks. Uh, the race ride of Memphis, uh, now it's called the Massacre in Memphis, but uh, a year later, uh, U.S. colored troops are here, Fort Pickering's getting ready to close, nobody knew where to go, people started looking at each other, shooting at each other, throwing rocks, and then one side, one then the Irish police force just decided to go down and wipe some folks out. And a terrible massacre burned all the churches and, and freedmen schools and raped and murdered about 50 folks. And this, uh, it what led to par partially what led to the passage of the 14th and 15th Amendments and the uh, black men getting the right to vote in 1870. And when we get to the women's point, you know, in 1848, the women wanted to get the right to vote. It only took 72 years. A lot of gridlock in Washington on that one, but we'll talk about that one later on. Uh, so the massacre in Memphis is a story that needs to be told uh, during the Reconstruction. Yeah, you know Thomas Edison lived here? Have y'all heard of Thomas Edison? <laughs> he's a smart guy. He was always getting in trouble. He's had to move around the country because he was blowing up labs or, getting, or making his bosses <laughs> jealous. So in Memphis, he worked there at Court Square at the Military Telegraph Company. Lived right down there at 372 Court. That's where, we curiously, we found our first artesian well 25 years later. Uh, but he invented, uh, he worked for the Military Telegraph com Company. He invented the telegraph relay. He invented a contraption you could electrocute cockroaches with in Memphis, Tennessee. <laughs> and no, none of y'all seen a cockroach ever since, have you? <laughs> and he was our first bat boy. He's an amateur uh, for the amateur baseball team. Our second most favorite bat boy, most famous bat boy in Memphis, second to Stan Bronson, as y'all know Stan, who's in the Guinness Book of World Records. Uh, Thomas Edison was here. Uh, the Peabody Hotel, business was so good, we're untouched by the war. We were a sanctuary city. We doubled our population during the war. Think about that. You couldn't even say the term sanctuary city back then, could you? Uh, so it's time to open the Peabody Hotel. Colonel Robert Brinkley, who finished the railroads from Iuka to Memphis, then from Memphis to Little Rock, did that. Befriended George Peabody, but George Peabody passed away that year. So instead of being called the Brinkley House, it's called the Peabody Hotel. Here's Memphis in the 1870s. No Riverside Drive. There's the High Bluff. No Mud Island. Uh, there's the Gale So Bayou right in here. There's the train line coming in, about where the Wendy's is right now in downtown Memphis. Uh, what the Civil War couldn't do to Memphis, the mosquito did, okay? S series of yellow fever epidemics in the 1870s. 1878, we start the summer with 40,000 citizens. 25,000 le leave immediately, they're scared. Of the 15,000 left behind, 5,000 die. Uh, we lose three-fourths of our population in one month here in Memphis. Go into bankruptcy. We lose our charter. We're a taxing district for 14 years run by the uh, State General Assembly up there in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, we found our Board of Health. Uh, we finally discovered our artesian well. Uh, we, all we did was pick up the dead, distribute the food, and camp on the bluff. We were a quarantine city for a long time. But one of my favorite guys, Colonel George Waring, came down here, and he's, uh, he invented this uh, sanitary sewer. He thought it'd be a good idea to separate the sewage water from the drinking water. Pretty healthy thing to do, don't you think? He's the same guy that cleared the lands 30 years earlier up in Manhattan for Central Park. So he had a good pedigree. And so he was, we're the, called the Memphis Plan. We're a model for 200 cities around the country. I bet you didn't know that when you woke up this morning, did you? You were thinking about it, weren't you, Carol? All right, between 1880 and 1920, like I said, 70% of the cotton was within 200 miles of Memphis. Cotton and the railroad brought us back out of this. Look at this cotton boat right here. 9,226 bales of cotton. You can see why these boats sank right? Or, or hit snags or caught on fire. How would you like to load that by hand? How would you like to unload it by hand on the other end? Uh, a port of river and rails. There's the old customs house with the towers. There's the old library. Uh, they're, part of those are still here. Uh, the Lee Line steamers was a FedEx at the time. Uh, Colonel Lee, he would go to Paducah and Greenville, bring packages down to Memphis, and the big boats would come by, take them to St. Louis, New Orleans, Cincinnati. He had a rule. All gamblers and fancy women must sign up with the captain before the boat leaves for New Orleans. <laughs> You're going to put that sign out in front of the Pink Palace, aren't you? They're already there, okay. Had eight railroads, so by this time we get eight railroads in downtown Memphis. We're getting out of it. How do you get a train across the river and you don't have a bridge? You put them on a ferry. It takes two days to get a train across the river, five cars at a time. So we decided to build some bridges in Memphis, you well know. 
uh, four, to, four to Arkansas, one to Mud Island in 1892. Now here's how we build bridges in Memphis. We start at both ends and hope they meet in the middle. <laughs> All right, this is not Photoshop because you know I can't do that. Uh, this is two months before the bridge opened. This is one month before the bridge opened. Would you go across that bridge? Well, neither would the inspectors. Typical Memphis construction. We condemned it before we opened it and we had to test it. We got 18 locomotives. We got 18 locomotives here and had volunteers to ride across the locomotives on the bridge we wouldn't inspect or insure. And it didn't fall down. It came back. It was the longest steel span in the country at the time. Uh, and it passed. And on May 12th, another great May event, uh, it opened up to 50,000 people. And that's what connected Memphis to Asia and the West Coast right there going across that river so fast. Here's our population growth during the time. You can see uh, right here, 1870, uh, we had 40,000. Um, the civil, the, we went down 16% in the 1880s due to the yellow fever. In migration from the Delta, sharecroppers coming up to the Memphis, St. Louis, Chicago, Detroit for opportunity. Immigration from Europe, Irish, German, Jewish, Italian coming in. Uh, by 1900, we had 100,000 people. In fact, between 1900 and 1910, less than 10% of the people who lived in Memphis were actually born in Memphis. We were a melting pot a long time ago. Uh, the greatest day, since we poured water with a paint bucket into the river, now this is the greatest day. We went over 100,000 mark, but somebody up in St. Louis didn't like that. And he said, the only difference between Memphis and Hell is that Memphis has a river running along one side of it, and Hell's River ran through it. Well, excuse me, Mr. St. Louis, but isn't that the same river that goes by St. Louis? <laughs> I say. 1904, we had eight automobiles in Memphis, and the speed limit was eight miles an hour. And we designed the parkways during that time. Have we built a better road since then? Okay, but you see the growth of automobiles here, so we had to get another bridge. We built the Harahan Bridge. You know, it is a big river crossing now, two-line railroad bridge. Cantilever supports going across, see right here, uh, over to Arkansas. Uh, and the Highway 70 came later on. Started the, started the uh, century, had the medicine that come in. Dr. Willis Campbell wrote the seminal manual for orthopedic medicine. It's in its 10th edition now. University of Tennessee opened 1911, Baptist 1912, Methodist 1918. Labana was a sewing circle of little old ra ladies with red threads sewing uh, clothes for orphans. That's about an $80, $800 million complex now. Uh, a 2015 statistic, look at all the construction going on, Church Health Center, International Children's Heart Foundation, uh, Southern College of Optometry, Shea Ear Clinic, uh, on and on and on. Uh, Health care hospitals are our number two employer in Memphis, by the way. Uh, a Plow, look at this. He got $125 from his dad to start Plow Chemical Company, 1908. You've heard of that. Sharing Plow, it grew all these products. One of the great philanthropists in Memphis in 1912. We had a big flood. It says, high water show is hell. And it was. W.C. Handy came up here. He's drawn up to Memphis. Again, the music store is going to be dynamite. I think that's February 14th. Get your tickets now. <laughs> uh, but he was uh, asked to write a song for a man running for mayor named Crump. Y'all heard of Crump? Yeah. Yep. Uh, and it's called Mr. Crump. And then three years later, he got permission to call it the Memphis Blues. And he, he published it at Pace and Handy Music Company there at Fourth and Beale, uh, which later moved up, to, moved up to where the Ed Sullivan Theater is now, still in business, the first blues song published in the history of our country. Beale Street was the main street of Negro America, a mile of vice and commercial ambition owned by the Jews, policed by the whites, and enjoyed by the Negroes. And that's what Lieutenant George W. Lee said, a black politician operative at the time, but it was a, the years of segregation, the first half of the century. Blacks couldn't go to Main Street. Whites could go to Mill Street. And that's where they collected. And it was about 10 blocks long, commercial stores, uh, drug stores, shoe stores, lawyer's offices, everything, uh, hardware stores. Uh, it wasn't the two block long entertainment district like you see now. It was a whole different street, just like Poplar Avenue or Summer Avenue. Anything goes. Here's the Blues Highway coming up uh, from the Delta. It was the field hollers, the work song, the spirituals, that came the gospel, the blues, and the jazz that came into Memphis, melted around in Bill Street, became rock and roll at Sun, and soul music at Stax. 1916, again, that Memphis music story is going to be really good. 1916, we changed the way the world shopped for groceries in Memphis, Tennessee. We opened the first self-service grocery store, Piggly Wiggly, by Clarence Saunders. Guys, he started to live here. He built this house, never lived here. I looked it up. You know, we got two really famous houses, a lot of famous houses. Graceland Men, one of them. I guess Royal Duck Palace is a famous residence, isn't it? Uh, and it, that's in the, another book. But uh, uh, <clears throat> Pink Palace, he never lived here. He lived in 17 different places in his lifetime in Memphis. Not this one. 
uh, not the one out on Quince either. But he just put this turnstile up, and he lets you go in and pick out your own groceries rather than somebody to go get them. Imagine going into Kroger right now and having to go through a turnstile and go by every aisle. How many murders would it be in Kroger right now? <laughs> Doing this. this was innovation 100 years ago. 1925, the Peabody Hotel opens, and the Mississippi Delta begins in the lobby of the Peabody Hotel and ends at Catfish Row in Vicksburg, Mississippi. That's a 1948 quote, and Jack Bell says on our video, as long as there's a Memphis... There will be a Peabody Hotel. Next time you see Jack Bell, he comes down and works out still at the weight room. He's a Capri Show. Come pat Jack Bell's on the back. Uh, 1927 flood, Rising Tide's a great book about that. We displaced 50,000 people. A lot came to Camp Crump in the fairgrounds. Look at all these numbers right here real quick. 27,000 square miles, over 30 feet of water. 200,000 African Americans displaced, $400 million in damages. That's $5 billion today. Uh, and like I say, just think about the yellow fever epidemic. It's the largest loss of natural, uh, a nat from natural disaster of life in our country's history. Over 5,000 people from Memphis. That's larger than the Johnstown flood, the San Francisco earthquake, and the Chicago fire combined. Think about that. So now we've got another 5,000 people displaced here. You know, Sultana sinks, bankruptcy, another tragedy here with the flooding. So the Flood Control Act of 1928, that's when the levee started being built. That Rising Tide book tells you all about it. Mississippi River Commission was formed in 1879, and this program is still in effect to this day because we still don't know how to manage that river anymore. We took off 180 miles of the river. 1930, we built the Steric Building. It was the tallest building in the entire South when it was built in 1930. The last skyscraper built in Memphis for 34 years because of the Depression, World War II, and post-World War II suburbanization of our community out east. World War II military presence in Memphis. Mayor, uh, Mr. Crump at the time, Senator McKellar, the longest running member of Congress in history up to the 1950s. Uh, Mr. Chandler in House before he became a mayor. They kept Chandler in there a little bit longer so we could get all these military appropriations for the Memphis area because they knew if you had these military appropriations, the, uh, factories would come like Kimberly Clark, Ford, uh, John Deere, not John Deere, and National Harvester, uh, Firestone. Uh, and, uh, and make these products for the war effort. When the war is over, they'd be here all tooled up for the domestic effort. Uh, like the Chickasaw Ordinance, like 8,000 people working out there outside of Millington every day making TNT for the British. And guess what? You couldn't smoke on that, that factory. <laughs> if you brought, a, you brought a cigarette in or a match, you're fired, you know. TNT. Uh, all these other things. But yeah, where else in, but in Memphis, Tennessee, would you build a veterans hospital on a street named Shotwell? Near the intersection of Dunn, Shotwell and Dunn, right here, right out here. So that, it got name got changed to Getwell. There's still a Shotwell that goes from Southern to uh, Park. It was named for a landowner at the time. All those streets in the normal neighborhood are named for landowners, Carnes and Douglas and all that. 165 buildings, 11 miles of highway, over 43,000 wounded World War II veterans. Came up this train line you don't like, right, and taxied over. You know, we, that train line, we're, we're in its way. It's not in our way. Fairgrounds, Bunton, Normal, White Station, Germantown, Kaiba. Where do you think they came from? The train line, you see. So these soldiers came up uh, for in a three-year period of time. I got a 1944 menu, and it was uh, a Christmas menu. It was turkey and dressing with all the trimmings. And the three dessert choices that time were fudge pie, pecan pie, and cigarettes. <laughs> World War II. It was on the menu. That's a dessert. Cigarettes. Right there. In a veteran's hospital. You watch those movies. You had always spoken and everything. Uh, that's Audubon Park right there. This is the South Campus, by the way. Memphis Bell, the most famous airplane, or the third most famous in our history, but the most famous one in World War II because it completed 25 missions over Europe uh, without a loss of a crew member at a time, and there was a 70% mortality rate. And I got to meet Colonel Morgan and nine of the crew members and Margaret Polk, and oh, I can tell you all sorts of stories about the Memphis Bell. And be thankful that Andy Pouncey and Dr. Harry Friedman and a lot of other folks that aren't with us now uh, got that bell up to Dayton, Ohio. It's on display after a multi-million dollar restoration. If you ever go to Dayton, Ohio, go see the Memphis Bell. But you think about a 70% mortality rate. Colonel Morgan told me he went to breakfast with 10 people and ate dinner with three people every day of other captains and stuff. So it was devastating. They were the, the symbol of American war, air supremacy. Margaret Polk was the girlfriend of the captain. He said he landed extra hard in here on his way to Europe so he could spend the night in Memphis one day before he went to Europe. Margaret Polk lived over near Overton Park. This is where her statue is there now. Modern Memphis, real quick. Here we go. This old boy went on a little 
family vacation to Washington, D.C. in 1951. Didn't like the roadside accommodations he was getting. So, you know, he's building homes. He actually built the home I live in on Sequoia in 1952 and uh, little ranch houses. And, and uh, so if you work for Kimmons Wilson, he was a great guy to work for. You only worked half the day, either the first 12 hours or the second 12 hours, right? <laughs> great museum over here in the Holiday Inn. And so his draftsman, he, he drew up this, uh, Kimmons drew up this perfect room for a family of four. Gave it to his raffins that night. He was, it was at Christmas time. He was watching TV. It was Holiday Inn. So he wrote in pencil that name as a working title. No money ever changed hands for the naming rights to Holiday Inn. And that's what they came up with. And curiously, Wallace Johnson was the president of the National Home Builders Association that year. And the convention was in Memphis. If you could build a home, you could build a 120-room hotel. Remember, they all looked the same, smelled the same, all the same. That's how they, they franchised that out, that one little formula right there. Here's the very first one on Summer Avenue. The restaurant was actually called the first one. Uh, here's a dedication. The mayor's 15 minutes late, so his children cut the tape. <laughs> True story. And then they cut it later on at another holiday in about 10 years ago. Isn't that cool? Kimmons Wilson and Mr. Crump uh, are on the cover of Time magazine. Uh, and, of course, Aretha Franklin was. Uh, the very, very, she's in 1967. Uh, but she only lived here two years. These guys weren't born here, but they lived here a long time and made their names here. So music real quick. In the quest to identify the roots of America's music, all roads led to Memphis. This is the Smithsonian Institution, the National Museum of American History, looking down at our entire country saying, this is where it began. You know, uh, the Skyway Room at the Peabody opened in 1939. Big band was playing there. One of three rooms in the country to play swing music over CBS National Radio Network. New York, Memphis, Los Angeles. Tommy Dorsey, Guy Lombardo, Andrew Sisters. Sam Phillips was an engineer there. Wait to hear those stories. Uh, the Blackwood Brothers uh, won, were nominated for Grammys more than anybody in the history of the Grammys. Uh, WDIA was the first all-black formatted radio station in the world in 1948. B.B. King and Rufus Thomas were two of the first DJs. That's how B.B. King got his start, the Goodwill Station there. Again, we're going to cover this real deep in the music story. There's old B.B. There's, and Nat D. Williams was the first DJ to go on the air. He was a, a teacher. Memphis Recording Service, Sam Phillips was recording. He was drawn to that raw, gutsy sound of Beale Street. And he was recording black artists like Howlin' Wolf and Johnny Ace and Rufus Thomas and Roscoe Gordon and, and uh, Ike Turner and Jackie Brinston. And what Rufus told me, Sam was looking for a white boy who could sing black music. <laughs> of course, that was Elvis. And so one night, uh, Elvis had been coming back and forth. Nothing was going on. So Sam paired him up with Scotty Moore and Bill Black. And they're in the studio late one night. Nothing's going well. They take a break. Elvis runs over and picks up Scotty Moore's guitar and a fit of nervous energy starts banging out, that's all right, Mama, really fast in the corner. Sam comes running out of the control room saying, that's it, that's the sound I'm looking for. He just took an old blues song by Arthur Crudup that was sitting on a pickle bucket in Handy Park and just sped it up. Shook his hips, neared his lips, you know. Uh, so what Sam says on the Memphis Rock and Soul Museum video, it's like I got stuck in the rear end with a brand new super sharp pitchfork. <laughs> wow, that sound just found them, you see. Just like coming out of the bathroom with David Porter, you know. So they took it. Uh, there's Bill Black. There's Scotty Moore. That happened on July the 5th. On July the 8th, they went down to WHBQ. And Dewey Phillips, I'm sure y'all heard Dewey Phillips, fast-talking DJ. He was playing music by white artists and music by black artists in the same hour, on the same radio station in the South. It was unheard of at that time, but it was the music the kids loved and the parents hated. And that's always generational. My mother didn't like the Beatles, I don't think, because the hair, probably. Uh, but he had to play an acetate. See, the way Sam would do it, they would go to an acetate. was a real cheap form of a record before they committed to, to pressing it at Plastic Products. And they could distribute that around the country. And DJs can play them in Denver and Kansas City. They went overnight by air by Delta. How about that for Delta D helping us? But they used to fly our records by air 60 years ago. And they said, oh, they love this Great Balls of Fire by Jerry Lee Lewis. Press that one up. Get it out in the jute boxes, okay? So Dewey's, his life is loosely based. The Memphis, mus uh, Memphis the musical is based on his life. Memphis is the only city in the world to have two Tony Award winning musicals about its musical history, the other being the Million Dollar Quartet. Uh, and Memphis, uh, oh, WHER 1955, Sam Phillips and Kimmons Wilson thought it'd be a good idea to put a microphone in front of a woman and let her talk on the radio. What were they thinking, you know? <laughs> but it was eight different women there, WHER, 1,000 beautiful watts down at the Holiday Inn on South 3rd. Uh, there you go. There's the wonderful women right there. Here are their names. You might know some of them. Um, there you go. Marion Keisker used to work for uh, Sam Phillips. The studio was the dolled in. The control room was the playroom. And the manager's office was Mark Bossman. 
So not only do we break the color barrier in radio in Memphis, Tennessee, we broke the gender barrier here in 1955. Lansky Brothers, we'll come back to that in the music story. There's Elvis. Uh, Sam Phillips recorded Elvis. Dewey Phillips played Elvis. And Bernard Lansky closed Elvis. Together they changed the world. Here's the Two Kings picture here at Ellis Auditorium taken by Ernest Withers. Who would have thought that two years later, or 60 years later, uh, these two guys would be immortalized in our Tennessee Welcome Center down there. Memphis is the only city in the world to have its name in song lyrics over a thousand times, too. Think about that. We got an intersection of king and king, and we got the three kings of Memphis here. Elvis the king gave us our voice. B.B. King gave us our soul. Martin Luther King gave us our conscience. That's an A.C. Wharton quote. We'll give him credit for that. Jim Stewart and Estelle Axon opened up a recording studio in Brunswick, Tennessee. Uh, got sued for the name Satellite, so they brought the Capitol Theater in South Memphis, took the first two letters of their last name, the S.T. of Stewart, the A.X. of Axton, and made stacks, and that's the home of soul music in America. Otis Redding, Sam and Dave, Isaac Hayes, Booker T and the MGs, Wilson Pickett, Eddie Floyd, on and on and on, blacks and whites working in the studio together, making the best music in the history of the world. When they couldn't go to a lunch counter together, go to a theater together, swim in a swimming pool together, 800 singles, 300 albums, Soul Man, Hold On, I'm Coming, Sitting on the Dock of the Bay, High, stu high, uh, high Recording Royal Studios, Willie Mitchell, Al Green, and Peebles, that same neighborhood, American Studios, uh, Chips Moment and the Memphis Boys, Dusty Springfield, Son of a Preacher Man, Sweet Caroline, that was written in the Peabody Hotel, recorded at American Studios, and don't go ba ba ba. we'll talk about that in the music story. <laughs> Elvis came back, did 36 songs in 12 days, including Suspicious Minds. Uh, again, there's the name of Memphis being used right there. St. Jude opened 1962, had a less than 4% success rate in curing the catastrophic childhood diseases of cancer and leukemia. About a 4% success rate and a $1 million budget for the entire year. Now that's grown to about 90%, but it costs $2.5 million a day to operate the hospital. No child or parent pays for their travel, their treatment, their housing, or their food on any visit to the Peabody Hotel, I mean to the, to the St. Jude Children's <laughs> Research Hospital. I say that at the Peabody Hotel every day. That's what I was thinking. Here's some great pictures. I got about three minutes here. Um, a. Schwab open. You've been to A. Schwab. Same old floor, same old junk merchandise. They've been 150 years. <laughs> Civil rights, real quick. Here's a lot of the great court cases that happened in Memphis. Don't buy gas where you can't use the restroom. Uh, Memphis State 8, the first eight black students. Again, we'll get this in the black century uh, of Memphis history. Uh, 1959, the Memphis 13, the first 13 children to desegregate Memphis City Schools. Pint-sized pioneers, 13 first graders. It's a great story. We did dedication historical markers for them. One of them's at Rodzell Elementary School. The Lee sisters, the most arrested family in America, according to Jet Magazine, for their nonviolent, peaceful protest uh, of lunch counters downtown. There's, the, there's Elaine Lee Turner right there for the heritage tours. Tragic accident, spark sanitation strike. Uh, the circumstances here, uh, black workers would be sent home. White workers should stay on in bad weather. So these guys stayed out a little bit late in a thunderstorm. Two climbed up in the back of the truck. It, it, it accidentally uh, activated, crushed them to their death. They didn't get treated right. Black sanitation workers go on strike. Uh, mayor says you can't strike, garbage piles up, Dr. King comes to town. Last March originates from uh, Claiborne Temple. This is it right here. Dr. Withers took this picture. Again, come back to the Black History Tour on this one. Last, and the riots and stuff like that. I was in the 10th grade. Tanks on Bill. Kind of looks like Bill Street now, doesn't it? <laughs> All the police cars. Uh, Mason Temple, the last speech of his life. Uh, I want you to play Precious Lord, pray it real pretty, was his last words on the balcony of Ben Branch. Mayor's office, it's finally settled out. The mayor's office has an open door policy now. There's a loaded shotgun underneath the desk right there. <laughs> Bob Williams took that picture. He's still around. We've got our heritage trail now. Those brochures are out there. This old boy got a C minus on a term paper for the idea of overnight package delivery by air. Got that at Yale. How would you like to be that professor right now? Y'all are millennials, right? Y'all call it FedEx. We call it Federal Express. Okay. Downtown Memphis in 1975, the Peabody Hotel was bought on the courthouse steps for $540,000. Bill Street was fenced off for six years. You couldn't walk a ride down Bill Street. The orphan was saved for $285,000. The uh, Lorraine were $144,000. By 1979, there's more people living in jail in downtown Memphis than living residentially. 500 in jail. Uh, 500 living downtown, 1,000 in jail, and the city leaders wanted to build a bigger jail. But the Belchers and attorneys said, no, we got to come back. There's a Peabody auction. So little by little, there's our number right there. In seven years' time, for less than a million dollars, we saved the three cultural cornerstones of downtown. 
Look at that urban renewal. 11 projects, 562 acres, over 3,000 buildings taken out in all that area. We're starting to reclaim some of it now. We call that urban removal. There's your Bill Street right there, folks. There's FedEx Forum. There's uh, Weston. So little by little, year by year, we started coming back. Peabody Hotel was the catalyst event. Grayson also helped in 1982. Uh, 1982, Mud Island, 83. B, uh, 91, B.B. King's open. Uh, uh, and and, and uh, Beale Street partially opened in 83, Orpheum Theater, 84, Memphis and May started in 77, they started building riverboats in their backyard in the 70s, they believed in Memphis, we lit the bridge in 86, Civil Rights Museum in 91, B.B. King's in 91, the Pyramid in 91, this bridge was built for four and a half million dollars, 600 acres right here of empty land, Commercial Pill says Hackett builds bridge to nowhere, 7,000 people living out there right now. Main Street Trolley, 93. AutoZone came downtown in 95. What a great corporate citizen they are. AutoZone Park in 2000. 20 museums in downtown Memphis today. Tourism and hospitality is our number three employer. Uh, 27,000 residents downtown, 110 restaurants. In closing, we say river, railways, roadways, runways. We're the number two inland port on the Mississippi River. We're one of three cities in America to have all five class one freight rail operators in it. Where I-40 and I-55 meet in West Memphis. That's the third largest center of trucking activity in America. And of course, our cargo airport here is the number one in America for the last 35 or so plus years. So transportation, distribution, logistics is our number one employer. We actually had, a, our state actually had a license plate in the shape of the state. It's the only state to do that, by the way. Texas couldn't do that. My big four, <laughs> <laughs> Piggly Wiggly, Holiday Inn, St. Jude, and Federal Express. Uh, we also had Welcome Wagon, uh, the duck, uh, duck Calling Capital is 80 miles to our, our west. The Bird Dog Museum is 60 miles to our east. Um, uh, the Ducks Unlimited headquarters are here because it's the Mississippi Flyway. 70% of the migratory waterfowl come down through. That's 300 species of bird annually. We had the first ever public enemy number one. Nike distributes 170 million pairs of shoes through Memphis each year. The big M on the bridge is the longest freestanding letter of the alphabet in the world at 1,760 <laughs> feet long. Uh, what else we got here? There's Barbara Walker. Oh, the big line, the line. You see the line roaring in the MGM movie? You notice that? He's from Memphis. Guess what he's saying? He goes, Memphis, Memphis. <laughs> you, did you hear that? Yeah. Well, that's the only lie I've told all day. <laughs> that was it. He says, roar, 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 roar. And even I can't get Memphis out of that. And here's those idiots taking that picture. <laughs> Not a leash or a fence or anything. Uh, Caillouville distributes more fishing lures than anybody. Barley, more 3D glasses. Uh, Olive Branch Motel, Mo Hotel Miniature Bar Soap. Our Kellogg's Prance makes more Rice Krispies than anybody. I can show you how to buy those at Kroger if you want me to. <laughs> home of the Blues, Birthplace of Rock and Roll, Cradle of Soul, Crossroads of America's Music. We're the home of the independent spirit, and Memphis is the center of the known universe, according to me. We've got 139 more hours to go. Uh, this is your Jimmy Ogle. There's my cell phone number. There's my website. <laughs>